All right, all right, all right. What's up? Thank you so much for checking out State of My Art Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Liorti. And on today's episode, episode 32, I sit down and get to know my new friend, Alex Williams of the project Sidewalks End, based out of Escondido, San Diego, California. Sidewalks End is like an alternative power pop emo, kind of throwback punk rock project. And Alex has been working very hard putting out a bunch of new music in 2020 and 2021. He has a new song coming out called One Eye Open. It's gonna drop April 23rd. Alex is a fan and friend of Jera's. Jera was on episode 28 of the podcast. I'll drop the link to that episode in the description as well so you can get to know Jera and check out his music on the State of My Art playlist as well as Sidewalks End. And yeah, he just hit me up, saw Jerry's episode and was like, hey, could I get on the podcast? I got new music coming out. So I was like, sure, come up. And I'm really glad he did because I learned a lot from that young whippersnapper. And I'm sure you will as well. So let's jump into it. My conversation with Alex Williams of Sidewalks End happened here at the Sharp School of Music and Studio in Oceanside on April 16th, 2021. All right, now we're officially doing it, redoing it. I forgot to yes. hit record, and we got like a minute and a half in, so not too bad. No. But we're back. We're, we're really doing it now. We're doing it now. Here we go. I'm here with Alex slash Will. Will is your birth name. Yes. I just found out. And you're in a band called Sidewalks End from San Diego? Yeah, Sidewalks End. Um, uh, it's sort of band. It's just me. Okay. But um, yeah, it is a uh, privilege to be here. Thank you. Yeah, dude. Thank you for coming up yep. and, uh, you know, dealing with all my craziness, setting all this up. No, it's totally okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm really excited. I'm really yeah. excited for today. Me Thank too, you. man. Um, it's a beautiful day outside, as I already said in the previous take. <laughs> yeah. And we are spending it in a windowless studio here at the Sharp School of Music and Studio in Oceanside. Where are you from in San Diego? I'm from Escondido. Okay. So, nice. yeah. Uh, that east out east in the middle of nowhere but do you know isaac park isaac park i've heard the name i don't he's about your age he's a, he's a drummer in um our band here oh okay okay formerly known as mainsail oh okay i actually yes i actually do know him i actually totally forgot about that yeah he <laughs> yeah. is an escondido yeah actually he goes i think he goes to my parents church oh, okay so, he probably he yeah. probably plays drums there yeah i think that's it yeah sweet um oh so small uh, thank city you. small i uh, know super small for such a large like area of san diego county you kind of just when we're especially in the music era, industry you kind of just know everybody yeah yeah, yeah dude it yeah. like i i say it every year Whenever I go to Nam, didn't go this year, obviously, mm -hmm. but you end up, um, you know, we're no more than what is it, two degrees of separation apart from all musicians. Dude, it's, yeah, it's, it's scary sometimes. It is very, it is very. And you hit me up because you know Jara. You saw Jara's episode a few episodes ago. Yeah, I've known Jara for about three years now, so it was really cool, like seeing him do a podcast because I love i love that guy so much i love his art i love his music like he's a great great musician he if anybody here that i want to become like just huge one day it's jarrah because yeah. he is so larger than life character on stage but he the, he's got he's like the perfect balance he's larger than life on stage but just normal like great dude off stage yeah, he really gets it. He really yeah. has been at it for a long time. Yeah. Um, I mean, I played my first show with him down here. I think we said it was 2014, but it was probably more like 2016 um, at this like burger joint with oh, wow. Little Heroin. And, um, I remember them. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, you know, back to being a small world. And um, it's cool that it's, it was cool to have him on and get to know him even more other than, you know, just seeing him at shows and stuff and hanging out. But yeah, really down to earth dude. And I'm really glad you hit me up. Thanks for reaching out. I always want to have new up and coming artists on the show as well as relic legends on the show. And it's yeah. kind of become this cool balance that, um, I'm hopefully building a little community around of like, 
new artists learning from the old artists and old artists kind of getting that nostalgic feeling of when it was fun or yeah, <laughs> yeah. To, to put it bluntly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks for being on and uh, congrats on putting all, all that new music out in 2020. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was, it's been good. It's been a good year. It's been a really cra- crazy, hectic and stressful year for a lot of people, but it's been, you know, I've found a way to really make it worthwhile for myself, I guess, you know, and, and hopefully, hopefully the music helps people through it too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. And again, like, thank you for having me on the podcast because I was really excited. I've been really excited. I haven't. Cool. I don't think you realize I'm very excited to be here today. No, I get it. Yeah. And uh, pleasure's all mine. Yeah. But I, I get what you what you're after is like it's you get all this new music um, building up, and then once you start releasing it, you're like, man, how can I get more people to hear it? So hopefully, this is a platform where people can check you out. I already added you to the State of My Art playlist on Spotify. Oh, thank you. Songs. Thank you. Which yeah. one? Oh, I can't remember the song titles. I did it like a few days ago. Okay. I'm so bad at song names. No, it's okay. What's Don't your favorite it. song of yours? Oh, man. Um, probably the, well, the ones that people know so far, not the new one that's coming out, but that would probably be my favorite. Yeah. Um, but probably the one I just put out, Candy Glitter Heart, because um, it, I'm, I'm a huge sucker for like old all time low boys like girls stuff. And I was hoping to make a song that would sound like that made a parade, like all those bands. And, um, I was super excited when that song seemed to be like my most played song. So cool. Yeah. Um, but even aside from that, it's definitely like one of my definite total favorites I've ever put out. Candy Glitter Heart. Well, if that isn't the one I added, I will now. Thank you. Yeah. And that's a perfect title for those kind of bands, those early 2000s, yeah. Boys Like Girls, All Time Low, Speaking My Language. Those are the two tattoos that I'm missing of this arm of influences that you yeah. mentioned earlier. Uh, those are two bands that I really, really looked up to um, and kind of had uh, really cool moments getting to know them as well. I'm wow. try, trying to get them on the podcast. Please. <laughs> it's, hard, it's, hard to re, it's hard to get a hold of them now. You, uh, <laughs> especially all time low, but... <laughs> yeah, for sure. It, I If you can get... Um, I'm trying to remember his name, Martin Johnson of Boys yeah. Like Girls. That yeah. would be incredible. Because I don't know if you listen to any of his new music. Yeah, The Night He's, Game. Yeah, Night Game. Oh my gosh. it's in, His new record's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Very 1975, but like very different oh yeah it's like music musical theater 1975 oh for sure yeah no it's really creative amazing i i've been listening to his i was listening to his last record all of pandemic and then um when the new one came out this year i was just so excited like it was incredible such a great record he put out amazing um like singles for it Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, they're basically he's he's waterfalling it like oh yeah a new song every month basically yeah i believe that that was what he was doing yeah that's pretty much the track you're on what is it like how many songs did you release in 2020 like eight um 2020 because i was leading up to a full ep i had released i think six songs so it was six songs you know total for 2020 and now it, it it's currently at eight within 2021 but um, gotcha. yeah total 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 of songs i have out now is about eight songs yeah sweet yeah and then one cover <laughs> Right on. Um, yeah. So how do you go about recording those? Do you do any of it yourself on like a DAW? Do you do the writing on a DAW? And then do you take it to another producer or? Yeah, actually, um, I have a really funny story about this because I only recently started learning recording and learning Reaper and how to, you know, doing, you know, just a little tiny uh, um, focus right and doing it that sure. way. But um, previous to that, I had a terrible way of sending demos. Um, I, and to answer your question, I go, my, um, best friend actually records me. His name is Freddie Padilla, um, cool. with, he used to be in a band called Amaya Lights and, um, like kind of in the metal core, like C world. Sure. So, um, I work with him and we record everything, um, pretty much like I would say at, at, in 2020 or 2021 now, 
I would consider would be um, industry standard of, you know, record recording kind of basement style and then programming drums and then, you know, everything else. We just we just love playing around with sounds and stuff and getting it just dialed in the right way um, as far as like plugins and different things of that nature. But yeah, um, my demoing process was insane though i'm surprised he didn't kill me because <laughs> i would record um i like i said uh before i used to have an iphone 6 before i upgraded okay and what i would do is i would take my um my guitar like my amplifier and i would hit record on the voice memo and then i would record a rhythm track and then a um like a lead guitar track and then what i would do is i would burn them onto cds and like using my old computer. Okay. Yeah. And then I would put the, I would take those recordings and put them on the CD, play them into a, um, a, um, like a CD player, yeah. just check the volume on it. And then I would pretty much sing at the top of my lungs into the, the phone and then, um, to make create like, one voice yes. memo of all the voice memos combined. Yeah. And keep in mind, none of this was tracked using a click. Yeah, so yeah. I had to do this by memory, and it sounded absolutely awful. And there's no percussion because no percussion, yeah. none. I can't, I can't play drums to save my life. But yeah, it, no percussion. It was just a, a guitar and my vocals, and then I'd send them like that. Hey, I mean, you got songs out of it, and yeah. like that's really all you need to come up with a great song. And I don't think. Um, all the programming and production that I've learned along the way has helped create better songs necessarily. The yeah. songs are the progression leads and vocals that you can just do on your iPhone. Yeah. And you can just record onto your voice memo and then um, you're going to end up bringing it to a studio or producer anyway. Yeah. If, if you want it to sound better than just you can make it sound, even if you can mm -hmm. make it sound really good on your own. Yeah. So if you can't make it sound good at all on your own, it's not a huge deal. As long as you're putting in the work to have the ideas laid down, which you seem like you've got that figured out, not only recording your ideas and songs and then bringing them to life, but we were talking before the podcast about how you make your music videos on iPhones. Yeah. On iPhones, everything's, we just shoot it on iPhones and then, you know, I, um, the last one I, for Candy Glitterheart, actually, I wrote, I edited myself, but, um, everything else we, you know, if, if we needed to, we would just sit there, you know, with his, um, you know, his desktop set up and we just start editing the parts and putting cool filters over it and doing whatever else we felt like it could make it, you know, just enhance the video. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean. I appreciate that though, you know, as far as like, I, I, I personally feel like when it comes to songs, it's always going to be, it doesn't matter. Like the recording quality is not the most important thing because at the end of the day, what makes an artist is how good of a song you can do or not. You know, the, yeah. um, the recording quality at the end of the day, is just like an added, you know, extra it's, it's extra because when you think about it, um, some of my favorite bands, you know, had terrible first records. Like yeah, as so far as recording, your sense of fail shirt. yeah, sense of fail. <laughs> like, um, yeah, let it unfold you. Great songs, bad great recordings, songs, bad recording. <laughs> uh, their EP before that was even worse. Um, from first to last, uh, first, re uh, first, um, album, uh, absolutely probably my number one least favorite mix, but it's one of my favorite records of all time. And um, it, it really just comes down to how well are the, are the songs. If the songs are, mm -hmm. you know, are something that you enjoy and other people are going to enjoy, then I feel like that's what's going to matter the most. It's it, it has it the again it it's like this. It's like you can make a great pasta, but what makes that pasta go from just I'm you know I just got home late from work and I just put together pasta into like a full like. 
I put my soul and heart into, you know, grinding the cheese and, sure. you know, like <laughs> slicing every tomato. That's like, it really just comes down to that. And and that same bowl of pasta, if served under the nice dim light, dim dimly lit restaurant could mm-hmm. be a $60 bowl of pasta. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I like that you um, recognize that the song is the most important. That's obviously mm-hmm. a thing that comes up a lot. And also... Um, Sometimes those bad recordings or, or, you know, not radio standard Mm -hmm. mixes can be, um, can bring out what is endearing of a band. Exactly. I had, uh, Chris, uh, Papa Dick. Amazing. Um, under, from Hawthorne Hawthorne Heights. Heights. Yeah. Yeah. On the podcast. And, uh, he said the same thing that like some of the early two thousands, late nineties emo bands that made this huge emo pop punk explosion it wasn't even their uh immense talent for songwriting even yeah but it was just something about the whether it was the lyrics or they had a really good drummer that um as long as they got out there and toured and did it Mm -hmm. that little light of endearment uh would shine through oh yeah Definitely. So, it, so I mean, w- what you just said, I, I really want listeners to take as, okay, I'm, I'm not going to hold off on releasing my music. I'm not going to, you know, it, my music, even though I can't get it to sound as good as what's on the radio now, Cardi B or whatever, mm-hmm. I'm going to put it out even though um, it's not at the level that I want it to be at yet. Because another thing is you're only going to get better at songwriting. So even if your songs are not as good as your new songs that you just wrote, but you're like in the final stages of mixing, I still think, you know, put it out because that's where you were at at that time. Mm -hmm. A lot of labels and such would argue. And I would even, I, I still hesitate on putting out new songs because I'm like, wait, but I have this other song that's better that I could probably finish fairly quickly and I keep doing that cycle. Whereas you're kind of young, fresh out of the gate thinking I can film a video for this song with my iPhone and have it up in two weeks. Yeah. Let's go. I'm, <laughs> I'm very much. And I, a lot of that I think comes from the waiting around in from like previous bands or whatever. Sure. It, it, it really destroyed me i hated waiting around i hated not just going and doing it Hmming and hawing exactly and I, i'm one of those people that likes to make a big noise when you know if you ask any of my like my friends from back in the day especially like the old we are one days or fear converged days like my, my previous those are your bands. Old bands yeah okay. my old bands like i was a super like rambunctious kid like extremely overly like just crazy (laughs) and um and i i'm kind of like that with my music too like i i sometimes i have to have somebody else say like dude you just put out a song do not put out another one and let let the you know let it let it grow a little bit you know before you put out the next song because my mind doesn't really stop running i I just i'm always writing like yeah i told you before we started rolling like i was up super late just already already like working on new material that's great and uh, yeah it's it's for me a very important thing that and I, I would say this for anybody who's like wanting to do music is really there's something and I think you've heard of this is called we call it demo itis, you know, where mm-hmm. we we just kind of we we record it or we get it semi recorded and then we just start going in this cycle of this isn't good enough or this isn't good enough or this isn't good enough. Well, and the way I look at demo itis is I liked it better when the lead riff was that I can't get out of ditching mm. that lead riff yeah. is, is a common demo itis but yeah I get what you're saying yeah see even that's like demo yeah like whatever whatever your demo itis is it's like this constant like um you know it could be my mix isn't good enough I don't like this lyric I don't, mm-hmm. it's this it's this is this we could do that for hours on end of nitpicking a song but at the end of the day it's like well um I guess for me at least it became a matter of 
I'm never going to just make something that's perfect. That's 100% perfect. I'm like, I'll give you an example. What a perfect record in my opinion is, um, I'll, I'll just, I'll just say like a perfect record is like, let it unfold to you since it's fail, at least songwriting wise, it's a perfect okay. record. Um, and I really, it's one of my favorites. And, but the thing about it is that, um, I'm sure if I went and talked to buddy Nielsen right now, he would tell me like a million things he hated about that record, but it's all comes down to growth. It all comes down to, you know, because as a listener, I'm not going to notice those things as a listener. Yeah. I'm not going to pick up that you might have like hit a bum note here or, you know, just the little things that, you know, as a listener, you're not paying attention to, you know, unless yeah, yeah. it was like super obvious, then, then yeah, do, do another take. But it, it comes down to like, if I can really put out something that my audience is going to enjoy and do I enjoy putting out, you know, the song or whatnot, I, and I'm even a. I'll, I'll give you an example. There's even songs that I've spent. I it it took me and um, Friday, my my producer slash manager or whatever. Um, we spent writing. We wrote the song kind of together because I wrote the song as far as like the lyrics and stuff on my own, and I just had it on an acoustic guitar. But we spent literally full. I think we did this is the most we've have ever spent time recording we it took us four sessions to record it because we kept rewriting the song and mm. using different instruments different sounds to try and dial in something because every time we make it it just sounded empty it sounded not there yet sure and then we eventually tried something and we both were like this is it this is how the song is supposed to sound and then once we got it there then we would just then we started taking away stuff you know we we would just be like okay let's this part builds up to this part it needs to you know have this this big drum beat you know these things that that bring it to fruition and then like after that we can calm it down you know and it, it comes down to things songwriting things um but it it shouldn't be so much that you're scared to release your own music yeah, yeah. uh I, I think deadlines are important too mm -hmm. to actually get things out and like i used to be really good at that mm. and then uh, now i'm in this stage of like i gotta beat my old stuff and i don't want to set a deadline where it doesn't beat that so you end up hitting those kind of curves but the fact of the matter is to touch on what you said about your favorite record is it's all subjective too right so you might ask them oh man like this is my favorite record what do you think of it and they might be like no like that's we were so whatever back yeah. then that they don't like about themselves. But the reality is it's subjective. So it was a piece of documented art in their growth as yeah. artists. So they, you know, stamped it, released it. And then you picked it up at a time where it was perfect to you. Mm -hmm. And so subjectively, it's a perfect record to you. And it was maybe at least what they intended it to be back then, perfect to them back then. Exactly. So, yeah, music being subjective is an interesting thing. And it's almost like, you know, what do awards even mean if it's all subjective, yeah, right? Like, exactly. You could, you could make a record that um, you think is so great and put it out and then two years later, you still think it's great, but there's only 10 people in the, in the circle of 5,000 who heard it that agree that it's great. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that it's bad. No, no, not at <laughs> all. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean I, again, it, there's only, and I had to learn this over time because I used to be super judgmental of different types of music i'm way different than i used to be as far as a music listener sure but i eventually learned one day that there's no such thing as like there's really just two types of music there's good music and there's bad music that's really at the end of the day that's it and even that good music and bad music subjective to one 
his yeah. own individual. There's yeah. nothing else. It's like, yeah, obviously you can quickly lump something in the bad category, mm-hmm. but that is also stemmed from your upbringing of influences too, exactly. right? Exactly, yes. Just like the good is being quickly lumped in the good category because you're like, okay, like – even if it's not a genre that you would see yourself playing or going to see live, yeah, it's still like, okay, well, like if you compare it to what it is influenced by and I can picture that demographic enjoying it, like mm-hmm. if it's Jonas Brothers-y yeah. and, and – it would work for if they could open for Jonas Brothers and play this song. Okay, yes, I can make that connection. Yeah, lump it in the good category. So I, I get what you're saying with that. Whereas when you hear like that song Friday or or whatever um, that came out way way back when, mm-hmm. everybody quickly lumped that into the bad category because yeah. it was like this is unauthentic. Like it's it's very clear that this was like created by somebody else or this is. Mm-hmm. A very uh, cheesy way to fame. Um, yeah. So people can see right through things that aren't authentic. But yeah. Um, even when I show some of my friends who never listen to like Screamo, mm-hmm. Under Oath. Yeah. Very quickly, if they're actually sitting there digesting it with maybe a good pair of headphones or mm-hmm. good speakers, um, or they're watching the video. I don't think anybody can watch that or hear that and be like, nah, this is bad. Yeah. I mean, there, and then, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like there's no, no matter what you grew up listening to a band like that, what, how creative they are. Mm-hmm. Even if you hate screaming, maybe my dad would have a hard time understanding <laughs> that that ba- band is amazing. Yeah. But I think even if uh, if he actually sat down and maybe read the lyric book and w- watched the video and listened with a good pair of headphones, yeah, I think even he would be like, they're a lot better than the other screaming bands that I hate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, it's definitely – I can definitely agree with that. I, I can definitely see that. Uh, Under Oath is one of my favorite bands too, so I have a bit of a bias. Nice. But, same. Yeah. But every Under Oath album that ever came out, yeah. It took me maybe a listen and a half for yeah. me to be like, oh, okay, I actually appreciate what they're doing. Because yeah. album to album is so different. And I wasn't like huge into Screamo when um, Chasing Safety came out. Mm-hmm. So it took me a good three or four listens from my friends being like, no, this album is amazing. Yeah. That I was like, oh man, yeah, it is. And then when Define came out, I was like, I don't know if I like it, them Mm -hmm. going this metal hardcore, but then I was like, no, at second listen, I was like, this is incredible for sure. Oh yeah. It's actually better than chasing safety. And then, um, what was after that one? Um, Oh, um, it was, (sighs) I I have it in my girlfriend's car right now. Yeah, actually I'm sure lost in the sound of separation. separation. I was like, Th- now I think it's just a little too heavy for me. Yeah. And then I was like, this is better than Define, I think. Yeah. And I, I I would say those are still tied in my book. But yeah, like a band like that, you just can't. Um, there's, I'm starting to find that I like every genre, but there's like a top five for every genre. Mm-hmm. And below that, I just. There's too many for me to even give them the time of day, too. That's fair. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to find new music, too, because I'm like, if you're going to sound like Death Cap, you better be as good as Death Cap. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's definitely fair, because I'm one of those people who will listen to the same records over and over again. It's very hard. But when mm-hmm. I hear something that I really like, I really like it. And then it becomes something. And a problem for me is I don't, I will, and I I just said it with Under Oath. I said they're my favorite band. I have probably thousands of favorite bands at this point because I can't choose which one is my favorite band. I don't have one. (laughs) Uh, And and I I say that about colors too as I get older if people ask like, so what's your favorite color? Like, well, it depends what object we're talking about. I really like the color red, but I don't necessarily like red guitars. Yeah. I like blue 
if I were to be on a hockey team, I'd want to be wearing blue. Yeah. But I don't want a blue guitar. Um, and I guess kind of the same thing with music. It's like, what's your favorite band? Well, it depends on the genre we're talking. Yeah. If I'm in the mood for some pop punk, mm-hmm. I don't necessarily want to hear Lil Wayne. But Lil Wayne's my favorite rapper. Mm-hmm. Probably. So, like... Yeah. No, that's that's totally <laughs> fair. That's totally understandable, too. Because it's like... Uh, I, yeah, everything's subjective. Like, really, at the end of the day, I feel like people are starting to learn that now more than ever. Mm-hmm. That, like, because I remember back in the day, people used to be, like, those kind of, like, the keyboard warriors, but for music. And it was, like, they they oh, they grasped onto that, like, this isn't true metal, you know, yeah, so yeah, yeah. hard. When there was, like, local music boards yeah. and stuff. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, that was, like, that was... Like people would genuinely would I'm oh, I'm not I'm not even kidding people would get in f- like fist fights over it yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know but nowadays people just it's like I don't nobody cares like it really just comes down to do I like it does this make me happy when I listen to it yeah I'm gonna listen to it again does this not make me happy when I listen to it mm, I, I I can't even say it doesn't make me happy maybe I just don't feel anything when I listen to it I'm just not gonna listen to it again you know it, it really comes down it's that simple. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I've been doing sound a lot now mm-hmm. that I moved down here at a lot of the venues, you know, before COVID closed them all down. Yeah. And the big, the hard thing for me to understand is why are less and less people showing up to shows? Mm-hmm. Like even some of the greatest out of town mixed with great local hardcore punk metal indie Oh, we got that timer. Yep. All right, we got it again. There we go. Uh, it's always in, it's always in the middle of my best sentence. Yeah. <laughs> um, even like some of the best shows that I'm at have really small mm-hmm. audiences. And then you know, before I moved down here, I was touring like eight to ten months of the year. Yeah. Seeing the same thing. Like I got the best local bands in town, and um, I have a decent following in this town. And I told everybody about this tour and this show and it's really hard to get people out to the show. And a lot of it, it was the same honest excuses of like, I have to work in the morning. I have a kid now. Yeah. Um, I have this, I have that. Um, this is the same day that my graduation is, you mm-hmm. know, I have a test tomorrow, all that stuff. And it's like, yeah, we're all so busy as we age and we're also kind of all evolving from kind of the golden years of music, which was mm. kind of the MySpace days, right? Yeah. When we were all in high school. I don't know. How old are you? I'm 20. Okay. So even you were probably um, familiar with that explosion when you were in high school. And- I was, yeah, totally. I, I, I would actually argue, I, w- I actually used to argue that my generation was the last of the Warp Tour. A, you right, know, generation right, right. that like, like who knew of Hawthorne Heights because we saw them play at Warp Tour. Who knew mm-hmm. of Silverstein because we saw them play at Warp Tour. But I only recently had that opinion change, and I can think that to one of the most unlikely things on the face of the planet. Well, two things: a pandemic and TikTok, <laughs> because TikTok has blown up, especially with seeing kids who f- really love. Um, that style of music oh. and they're putting out content that they just do it because they love it and they don't care if people hate it or not right. and and i fully support that because i think it's one of the coolest things ever that's interesting i didn't even know there was that world on tiktok oh yeah are you it's i just huge. keep seeing the same you know cat world dance world you know, the- put in, I recommend if you want to go put in emo TikTok and just scroll through and see what you can find. I, I, I wrote like a joke one minute song about how I just can't figure out algorithms and <laughs> it's the most frustrating thing for me. Um, so yeah. And okay. So even to touch on that, mm-hmm. there's this world that still exists. Yeah. There's emo nights where people will go mm-hmm. listen to the, that MySpace era yeah. of music but they won't go see it live, especially the new up and coming artists that are creating that sound yeah. at a higher fidelity sometimes even, or even better songs sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would see that all over the country and then doing sound here. I'm like, 
this band's great. Why isn't anybody here? Yeah. And sound guys would tell me that all the time too. Like you were great. I can't believe no one showed up. And I'm like, what's even crazier is I messaged 80 people that have seen me before to come see me again. Yeah. And they're like, the, yeah, this is crazy, man. I remember 2009, 2008, mm-hmm. everyone was coming out to shows, especially for out of town bands. And yeah. we'd get it. And this is another reason I wanted to start this podcast is I would have such great conversations with some of these yeah. sound guys and venue and, and promoters. Yeah. Um, and other bands. So the fact that we're all into every genre of music now because mm-hmm. we've kind of evolved our ears probably because we can listen to anything at yeah. the press of a button it just doesn't make sense that well now with the pandemic it makes sense but before that yeah. why wouldn't people be like you know what I've been listening to this band a lot I've been listening to this genre a lot San Diego's an exception. That's why I moved here is yeah. people ha- were like, hey, you know what? I've been listening to this genre of music a lot. I'm going to go see this rap show. I'm going to go see this pop mm-hmm. punk show. But every other city, it seemed like um, the toxic, I hate this band, hate that band from the local message boards yeah. while people were going to shows. Yeah kind of got worse on a global scale too. Oh, yeah. Like everyone totally. was bashing every band and canceling this band and all of this like really toxic crap was going around in the underground scene, yeah. especially that it kind of uh, destroyed the local music scene. So I guess it kind of does make sense when I'm sitting at the soundboard going, why, why isn't anybody here? Yeah. Um, but it's like, it doesn't make sense because we're so open to every genre now. Why don't you just show up expecting that, well, this venue has state-of-the-art equipment. Yeah. Chances are I'm going to like this butt rock show even. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes I'm doing sound for bands that sound like Nickelback and I'm like, I would have hated this when I was 14, but this is actually really fun <laughs> yeah. mixing this band. <laughs> That's fair. I think, well, I think this is a great, like, I'll, I'll hit you with a question. What age were you when you first got into music? Like, and I mean, like, it wasn't like just like mm. you're driving to the store with your mom and she's playing like, uh, I don't know, you know, whatever, whatever moms would listen to, you know? It was so gradual that it's hard to yeah. tell. Yeah. Okay. So because it was gradual. I was really into what my, my brother was showing me when I was 10, mm-hmm. 11, 12. Okay. And that's when I started begging for a guitar instead of the piano lessons that I was forced into. Yeah. But actually taught me a lot and made me able to pick up Weird Al songs and songs that were on Tony Hawk really quickly. So, like I had a I had a good ear for music because of that. Mm-hmm. But I would say between ten and fourteen was this big transition of wait a second. Maybe my life belongs in music. So that's the, that is pretty much the key to the problem. The problem is, is like in any, like any generation, you have people who grow up. And I do think that there's a lot of different reasons. It, it can apply to either you got into music, but as you got into music, you fell in with the wrong people, you got on drugs. It could have been, I got into music and it was a really bad time in my life and now I'm trying to clean up. I'm trying to, you know, it could be a million different things or it simply is, I got busy. I started a family. I, it, you know, people have excuses of, upon it, especially as you get older, you know, if it, though the list can grow as to how much your time is spent doing something. Right. And this is what it comes down to me. It's like, I was thir- I was actually probably younger. I have always loved music, but specifically when I was 12 was when I discovered Switchfoot. Okay. And, um, I actually discovered them because, um, their guitar player was a family friend of ours. Oh, sweet. And, um, I got really into music after that, like, like obsessed. Great band. Yeah. Uh, amazing. And I would go see Switchfoot all the time. I go like, uh, like I got super ex- obsessed what it came down to. And I think this is the thing with a lot of it is the, there was no, it was a couple things. I think. It was one, the crowd got old and they got jaded, 
which I think can happen. Or just busy with life, busy like with your original life. point. Yeah, exactly. Busy with life. And I think the other thing that happened was you need fresh blood. You need more kids. I think it, one of – and I, I'm – to some, maybe this is controversial, but I think it is a, a really good point to bring up is that it is extremely important to go and just doesn't matter who it is. I'm going to if I say I'm going to go and say I have 80 tickets left for Soma that I have to sell. I need to go to the mall. I am going to bring my guitar. I'm going to literally like do anything I can just to talk to somebody, say, Hey, I really like your song. And if they want to throw a, you know, a a dollar and maybe you stop them and be like, Hey, do you want to come actually see me live? And then you can start conversations like that. And then you can, they, you can sell a ticket right on the spot. Yeah. And I I think that's what the problem was. I think to, to an an extent bands, at least from my generation, because I keep in mind, I was super young too. I didn't know what marketing was. I didn't know what any of that was at the time. But what I did, what I can understand now is that you, as a band, as a lineup, you bring the crowd. You, it, it is it mm-hmm. is detrimental that a band go out and really put it out themselves out there that we want you to come to a show. And I remember this, this was a big issue um at least from like our our like bands is like we were terrible at promoting shows we would post a flyer once not even say you know like anything in the description of instagram or whatever sure and then it's like oh we did our promoting for today Nah, man like it's let's put something up on instagram let's do maybe a giveaway of a ticket Mm -hmm. like we'll prepay for it and then we can give it away to one person Mm -hmm. um let's go out to the mall let's go talk to kids let's try and sell cds let's try and sell tickets um uh i think another good example would be like um i actually have a friend who used to be in a band called adult science from here they were kind of like pop punk Mm -hmm. and they would go to um belmont park in the like that like the the little grass area yeah and it would sit there play their guitars and kids would just start like being like oh this this looks cool you know the these guys are good they're playing music that i relate to yeah and then they'd show up and then soon enough you'd have kids who would be like who would come up and say i really like your music and it's like oh thank you you want to buy a ticket to our show we have a show coming up and then especially when you're at that age like 6 15 14 15 16 17 whatever your age range is you're a little more likely to be like yeah yeah because it's like you're not you know, and then maybe not everybody but for the most part when you're a you're a teenager. You're 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 you focused. You want to get out and meet people yeah. and have a good time. Exactly. I hear that point, um, and I understand why you said it could be controversial because mm-hmm. um, I understand the other side of it too. I understand that the grind could be all for nothing. Yeah. Exactly. I, I mean, I've you know, um, the Warp Tour was a really good example of going right after your demographic mm-hmm. they would be lined up waiting to get in yeah and me and all the other um parking lot leeches as we were called yeah would go up to everybody and um put headphones on them and yeah. say listen to my song and hopefully they'd buy a cd um or you would do it because you had a show coming up i would do that at local shows all the time boys yeah. like girls shows and it would work especially back then yeah but i i found year year after year at warp tour mm-hmm. even if i brought young guys with me yeah. who were doing it who were younger than me um with that young crowd who should be stoked to find new bands and go to a show next week yeah it seemed like it was becoming less about the music and less about finding new bands mm-hmm. and being stoked on it and more about the clout and more about well who are you are you famous yeah should i get a picture with you and put it on my instagram so that people will think i'm cool it became mm-hmm. more narcissistic and about perception to the fan as well which um gets really frustrating for artists because you kind of have to accept it and roll with it and yeah. uh, you see a lot of artists doing that as well like okay how can i post content that's not about me but makes people enticed to n- 
get to to follow me yeah and um a lot of bands do that really well so it's it's a tricky line to walk and yeah you don't want to just like post your show flyer and and be like well people know about it yeah and then you also don't want to do what i was doing a lot and that was like personally messaging fans who signed up and be like well if i personally message them then mm. they're going to be really stoked right no no no, no. the no. way it works now no. is they're going to be like Oh, is is this my? Uh, am I supposed to be friends with this person? Hey, you haven't messaged me in a year, and now you want me to come to your show. Hey, that's that's where you play that tricky line too, because yeah. I've I learned something extremely important, especially lately, and that was when I I really came down to this. There's no shows right now going on, mm-hmm. but I'm I have horrible texting anxiety. I actually I'm not. I don't, like if I someone doesn't reply? No, not if somebody doesn't reply. I have horrible texting anxiety me, like answering back because I usually okay. just don't know what to say. Oh, But okay. I start and I usually feel like I am like almost like copy paste without copy paste. Like I just say the same things over and over again. <laughs> but what I learned was, you know what? If you're going out of your way to listen to my music and that's what and you really like it then of course I'm going to ask you how your day is going. Of course I'm going to keep up a conversation, a personal connection conversation with you. Because if that's a way for us to connect, you know, just on a human level, and then that's great. I would I would rather have more human connections and you just like my music and then we become friends because of that than it, it, it be like this, you know, it doesn't always have to be marketing. And that was what my problem was, is that I always thought like it was marketing. Like I'm just saying, saying thank you over and over again. But it became, it started becoming less of like, thank you. Thank you. Smiley face to thank you. How's your day going? You know? And yeah. um, then you could do things like that. But then, yeah, I remember, especially the Warp Tour, like the, then even the name, the Warp Tour Leeches, that yeah. was I remember when I would go to Warp Tour feeling kind of annoyed when people oh, would come up sure. to me. Yeah. And I I don't know why that was with the Warp Tour, why it became that way with Warp Tour specifically, but I do feel like there there should be and I remember I'd be waiting in line with my friends and people would come up to us and I'd be like, Oh my gosh, like don't talk to me. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And it and, makes sense. You, yeah. You, you're getting all, you're, you're there to see all, you're already there to see like 20 bands that you love. Yeah. And now someone that is just like, probably just some local band that, you know, recorded this in their basement and you're like, I'm here to see the big boys. So, like, come on. <laughs> this is also a perception thing that a lot of people don't understand is that you do what it comes down to too. It's how you, people perceive you because unfortunately and it, it sucks that humans are like this but we are very visual creatures we look at something and we immediately box it in judge one the thing. book by its cover yeah we judge the book by its cover and if and i remember this i remember like 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 say if somebody came up to me and they didn't look or maybe i would i'll use myself as an example and like say if they came up to me and i just like i could i could just analyze what they're wearing and be like okay you're this and but they may not even be that you know and um i think what it, it kind of sucks that we have to do this but it is the truth of of you kind of got to fake gonna, it till you make it yeah, to impress I'm these people. Yeah, I'm going to fake being that person that you want to take a picture with until you actually do want to take a picture with. Yeah, me. that came yeah. up on, on uh, my last podcast with uh, Jesse Eisenbart too and mm-hmm. Nick Lenari. He, he firmly believes in that. So to your point of wanting to have a personal connection with this fan who loves your music because you genuinely, genuinely feel an immense appreciation for this person acknowledging your music. Mm -hmm. I get that, but that kind of can counter the fake it till you make it approach. It does counter it. That is extremely true. And it used to work for me locally. Like I used to have, especially when I was in high school, a lot of people come out of the woodworks in school and, and be like, Hey, uh, I really like, you know, that battle of the bands you play. When are you playing more shows? Yeah. And you know, family, that kind of works too. When, when can we see your shows? Yeah. And it's like, all right, sweet. I'm going to finally sell these Soma tickets. Right. Yeah. Um, 
But once I started getting on the road and doing that with people, especially people who were like, you could stay at our place. Like, we're so glad to yeah. have met this famous person. It was really awesome. And they would like my music. Mm. And, and then we'd build this personal connection, sometimes way too personal. Yeah. And then it kind of comes back to bite you in the ass because they're like, subconsciously maybe you wait you're still nobody wait you're still yeah. playing at that small bar i told you to play at that big venue wait you're only messaging me when you're coming through town exactly and, and I, I genuinely feel an immense appreciation to all the people who gave my music a time of day especially a place for me to stay on tour yeah um and coming out to the shows it's like if you only knew how grateful I am. Yeah. But sometimes they get the opposite um, perception of you where yeah. they think you're unappreciative because you only message me when you come to town. It's mm -hmm. like, well, there's like 2000 of you that signed up for the email list. Yeah. I can't message you all every day to see how your day is going. Yeah, exactly. And also like you have no idea how stoked I've been all year to see you again. Friend, yeah. you know, yeah. person who bought all my merch. Like I, I genuinely love you yeah. and I don't want that to sound creepy, but it's you true. supporting my entire existence of making music for 14 hours a day. Like I love you more than you could ever understand. Yeah. Um, so, but you have to kind of pretend you don't, you have to kind of pretend that like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Things have been going so well for me that, um, I'm really sorry that I haven't had the time to hit you up about the show, but I'm glad you found out about it and you're here because you mm -hmm. think I'm a big shot. <laughs> it's so dumb I, to think. It, it, it can be kind of dumb. <laughs> I think, I think there, there's always going to be a balance. You know, when it comes to people who've known you the longest, those are the people that you're going to be like, they're, those are the people that are genuinely got For my sure. back. You know, like I, I give you an example. This is this was my big turning point when we played one last show as a band before, like my, in a sorry, <laughs> in a local. Like it was my last time playing a local show was in 2019 around October. Okay. We had a big music festival we were doing. We actually the goal of it was to be like local warp tour. Where was that? It was at Shea Cafe and we had we built we did two stages. We had an outdoor stage and an indoor stage and we had 12 I think we were on the was, back patio there. Yeah, Sweet. we had a lot of bands. It was it was stressful, but it was a good show. Um the thing about it though is that we played that show and then my band just it didn't, we didn't do anything after that, you know, and I, I could go into a million reasons, you know, as to what ultimately happened. But essentially, uh, even for me, like I after we played that that last show, I felt like something in my life was complete and I just felt like I needed to move on. Yeah. And I remember how many friends I lost because I kind of almost in a way started my my quarantine before quarantine Fair. because i felt like Same. i lost a lot of friends i like there weren't people hitting me up to hang out anymore cuz i wasn't really doing anything musically anymore at least that's how i felt and uh, i had i wouldn't call it the worst birthday ever but like it, it, i'll just say like like my um i had that my birthday is in november so it was act after october and my it was a kind of a bummer birthday you know it wasn't a worse obviously i actually had a good time with my significant other doing something but other than that it was like like none of my people i considered my friends didn't come none of you know and it was a huge bummer for me because i felt like i was now like like i would go to a show or something i kind of just felt like alone you right. know and maybe I wasn't as alone as I thought I was, but I really felt. Yeah, it could have been from the high to the low, like the the post warp tour depression exact, was a real thing. Oh, I believe it. Yeah, where it's like you have these great days with everyone, and then you kind of and you're doing you're on this high every day where you actually don't even need any sleep because things are going so well and yeah. it's so exciting. And then you go back to normal life or having a normal job, and you just feel kind of alone. Yeah, I, I that's how I I felt, and I felt actually I have a song kind of kind of about that on my first record or first record ep essentially and mm -hmm. it um what's that song called it's called gas lamps and it's cool. actually it's kind of a it's kind of like an ode to kind of like 
like that feeling of like Nassau. I wish I could go back to that. I wish I could go back to to my friends, to all of that. And it's almost like this this memoir of would I really want to go back to that? Would I really want that? Because at the end of the day, the people who are in my life now were, were the ones who consistently were my friends, who were the ones who wanted to be around me, even if I was or was not in a band. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, when it comes down to even with the fans thing, it comes down to understanding that there's a relationship with everything. And sometimes that relationship is 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 like band fan oriented and not yeah. necessarily like but not there's always like yeah you're my friend you're always gonna yeah you are my friend but like like there there and it's understandable that there's a difference between you're my friend and you're my friend I've known for 10 plus years and we have we've been through thick and thin together you know like it, it's been like a long ride and there's always that difference too. I think I think there has to be like an awareness of like of it. And like for me, I would see it this way of if I had to message people every single day, it would get tiring because I don't like texting. I'm actually I, I feel really weird about it. Yeah. But I will try and check in when I think about it. You sure, know? sure. And 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 see how that person is doing especially through this social distancing oh, yeah. it's it's kind of nice when i just think of like that someone who was at a show a year and a half ago yeah yeah and sometimes i'll just straight up because i don't maybe sometimes it's easier for me to just make a call i'll just call them you yeah. know and um and that that can also be a thing and i i know how Oh, I guess the thing is, is just finding that way to just grow. Because at the end of the day, the fans who supported you from the beginning also kind of move into that that realm of you're not just a, a fan anymore. Mm-hmm. You were a fan of me when I was playing to nobody. You know, you were the kid who showed up. Yeah. Who, who showed up to a random show in the middle of nowhere. And sometimes they go through their waves too. Yeah. And, and like, you know, they'll be totally uninterested in the music you put out for two years, not because of the way it sounds, just they got a new job yeah. or they got a girlfriend and that's their life now. Um, so it's understandable when people go through phases like yeah. that. Um, it's just, and you know, I'm guilty of it too with some of my favorite artists when they come out with a new project or a new album. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm just not ready to go there yet. Yeah. Um, but I'll get there. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, to, to the way I personally suffer from that, uh, depression and anxiety of like, wait, this person had me as their, uh, avatar (laughs) picture on all their social media for the last year. And now they're just not going to come to the show because it's their friend's birthday party tomorrow. Like there's stuff like that where it's like, it's really confusing to me, but at the same time I have to like, now that I've taken a big step back from it, from touring, especially, I can really ground myself and be like, wait, you did that to some of your favorite artists who Mm -hmm. you were essentially just a fan of because of their music. Yeah. So I'm actually like kind of the opposite of that where Mm -hmm. like I have no problem having no personal friendship with a lot of these fans. Yeah. I love them for listening to this music that I put my entire heart and soul into. Yeah. And for supporting me and for carrying a really cool conversation and finding out about their life. But I have no desire to know how their day went. Mm. Honestly, um, I have so much else going on and people that I feel guilty that I actually love, like my family, that I never really check in on because I'm just so engulfed with my day to day. So I'm sure I'm going to have a lot of regrets about both sides of that. But at the same time, my biggest regret currently is that I wasn't able to find a clever way on social media, TikTok, to generate more of a following yeah. to come to these shows so that I could tell Soma, yeah, I'm cool with headlining and we can move it to the big room. Like, yeah. That's my goal. Yeah. You know? 
So. I think even to an extent, there will always be that. If someone hit me up and was like, oh, yeah, are you cool with playing the big room headlining? And if you say even I'm not, like, fully confident, I'm just going to say yes and you can do it now and figure it out later is essentially how I do it. And just be like, all right, well, okay, this is how many tickets I need to sell. Um, I'm going to do everything in my power to sell every last ticket sure. that I have. So I'm going to go to like, and it's not just shows. Like again, like I, I, I don't know why I keep bringing it up. But I really feel like the mall is a great place because you have a giant yeah. place that every different person loves. Your grandma loves the mall. Your your friend down the street loves the mall. Yeah. Your um, yeah, again, everybody emo but kids you love could, the mall. You very quickly become that parking lot leech. If yeah, you, if you you can if you, and especially if you there is a way to make sure that. And I've been kicked out of several malls. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I've heard about <laughs> Across it. Across the yeah. country. I think it just comes down to even just like, hey, maybe I'm not going to go up to you, but the people who will want to are the ones who come up to you. So if they come up to you, and it may not even be about music. Uh, I, I actually worked at a Spencer's um, over Christmas, and people cool. come up to me and see this, actually this shirt, the yeah. Census Fail shirt, and be like, I love Census Fail. And I would go and be like, awesome i love census fail too you know and it's like it becomes this thing of like you you converse and of course in my work setting it would be like to converse so that they would feel you know like they want to come in the store because um but um say if it's like in a music setting it could be like uh, i okay i get this a lot from all right i i get i've this has been a consistent thing for about two years <laughs> at some point or another uh i started getting people come up to me and tell me i look like sonny moore like skrillex okay and it was kind i always kind of took it as endearing because i love you know from first to last this is like a huge inspiration to me yeah. but like i I remember also kind of laughing because I'm like, ha ha ha, yeah, I look like I look like Skrillex, like, uh, like, like I'm not Skrillex, you know. I'm oh, there it is again. Yeah, like I'm not, I'm not Skrillex. I'm not, <laughs> you know. No, but you have a look that's like, hey, I want to meet this guy and get to know. Y- you have an artistic look to you. Is yeah, the best that's way a good way of putting it. Jera has, you know, make sure he checks that box off too, so that yeah. yeah, people come up to you and talk to you. And I mean, I definitely have no shortage of people coming up. Sorry, mm-hmm. I'm six foot nine. People t- come up and talk to me all there the time. There you go. Yeah. Most, mostly people who are interested in sports. Yeah. But and you have interesting tattoos because say if somebody recognizes yep. that death cab tattoo they're gonna come up to me i love death cab so yeah i get approached a a, a lot for those things my point is the conversion of getting those people who came up to me to talk to me about my height or my artistic image converting them to being a follower Mm -hmm. has gotten harder and harder and harder since my space i think every artist can agree with that oh yeah and um so i think people's perception and You know, the idea of there's a huge emo community on TikTok. And for some reason, there's a huge emo community showing up to emo nights where there's no live music. Yeah. And there's uh, a huge um, kind of rebirth of emo music that is from 15 years ago. I guess that kind of makes sense because, yeah, Yeah. maybe there's like 80s nights that are it's exactly music from yeah. 80s nights. So like that makes sense that that exists, but why is it he- bigger than live music? And is there a way that we can introduce a platform that is as fruitful and, and rich as MySpace was for new music coming out? Because I feel like we, we still haven't and Spotify's trying. Um, and it's great that, they um, are able to, you know, put music out for all these artists. But the the problem is there's really no way to the, – the people are the problem. I don't feel like it's the, the platforms so much mm-hmm. because people are so distracted with their short attention spans that they're – 
definitely on their phones all day and potentially making their this content because like i originally yeah. said it's become kind of a self-absorbed world that we're in with our phones now maybe they just maybe that's the real reason they don't have time to come to your show maybe that's the real reason they no longer have 10 bucks to buy that ticket mm-hmm. that, so that's the conversion true. rate is way tougher because of that reality um so i think there needs to be something where it's like the most frustrating month for me mm-hmm. on tour as an artist was the month that Pokemon Go came out. Ah. Because yeah. I I was I was at the point where I was renting venues out and booking local bands. I was a promoter yeah. and I would play my own shows. And I would book shows in Louisiana and this like Places I've never been yet, but I knew this is the venue you want to book and it's worth the $400 down payment. Yeah. And it used to work. And then Pokemon Go came out mm-hmm. and everyone was down the street at this gym. Yeah. Catching Pokemon. And I was like, that was like my lowest low. I was like, mm-hmm. I can't believe this is happening. I finally got the good venue and I'm here to impress and yeah. I'm here to fill it and I'm here to sell some merch. And, you know, yeah. I'm like in business mode and yeah. Pokemon Go is taking everything. So that could be part of the side um, thought that went into my video game idea, which I don't know if you've heard about. I have not heard about. Yeah. But this could be the platform that introduces people to new mm-hmm. music. It's essentially the most realistic video game of all time about being an artist, whether you're a rapper oh, or a musician. Okay. So you're starting at like promoting at the mall. Yeah. You have to sell tickets for your show at Soma. Yeah. And then eventually you get to a level where you got to fill the gas tank and tour and try and, yeah. you know, bring recyclables to the recycling plant to create side cash and yeah. you get side quests from the promoters to play the song right. 2% of the game is playing the colors on the screen yeah. in DDR style or whatever. And then the other 98% is all the bullshit we have to deal with yeah. to try and build a following and try and uh, keep the sound guy happy yeah. so that he makes your sound good and all the little nuances it's that go into a being a successful idea. artist. So, and then it, it evolved to being so realistic that you have to write music and put it out on the game and then you could go in fan mode and and network at shows yeah. and find other people's new music in the game and virtual virtual reality becomes so real that this lull of not going to shows that mm-hmm. we're having becomes well now I go to shows on the grind is what yeah. the video game's called the grind that's that's actually I and like I that. found this band from Japan who's killer and I'm able to go to their show once a week yeah for free <laughs> and I love their music. I follow their music on Spotify now. Yeah. <laughs> so I do think that that is a good way because I, VR, yeah, that would be a very fun VR game, especially oh, yeah. like, like in, in VR. And, and some of the um, maps and, and technology behind some of these yeah. games now. Like oh, yeah. we're almost there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I I think that would be interesting too. I, I I'm gonna show you this after we get off, but I I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, shout somebody out right now. His name is Morris, and he has started an app called Sound Off. Okay. And Sound Off is literally trying to be a social media and Instagram slash TikTok essentially for okay. music only. And what it is is you have a for you page, like it would be on TikTok, but when you swipe. It brings up new songs, brings up new new artists that you might like, and you can like them. And when you actually like a song, it saves it to a playlist of songs that you like, and it tells that artist and it tells you, I, I signed up for it. And I'm actually doing kind of like a little like uh, like a like, beta test for it. Yeah, a beta test. And I actually reached out to um, him, uh, Morris, because he, one of his actual street team people reached out to me. And I decided to reach out to him and ask him about, OK, how does the algorithm work? How does this stuff? And mm-hmm. that ended up resulting in me and him getting on a on a phone call for about an hour and a half and just literally running through a bunch of different business ideas too for the app. So if that's something you're interested in too, that might be something you might want to look into. Yeah. I mean, I get hit up Mm -hmm. about apps all the time that 
I used to be very optimistic about being the game changers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, definitely. for live music, yeah. I, I tried. I tried one for one of my tours for my EP release. That I was like, you know, maybe this is the answer to get people to commit beforehand. Yeah. Because the cities where I would show up a week early and yeah. hustle tickets at the mall and hustle tickets to all these fans that yeah. saw me last time uh, were going so well. So I've I've tr I tried to 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 go in that business mindset with apps that were being developed around that. And uh, similar to apps like this, where it's like, okay, you create a profile. Yeah. I have so many profiles on all these different apps now. Yeah. Um, and I think that they're great ideas and yeah. I really want them to work. And you know, who knows, maybe his will. But I think we have been kind of taken advantage of so much as humans mm -hmm. by these companies who create these social platforms. And I know this sounds like conspiracy, conspiracy theorist, mm -hmm. um, controversial kind of stuff, but you got to remember like the people who work at Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, the people who are behind the marketing yeah. and getting you to, to keep clicking that app and yeah. TikTok to go back on that app. They're the same, they're of the same studies and some are the same people even yeah. as the people who have, who create the, the incentive for people to go back to the casinos. Right. We yeah. all know that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's psychology, you know, marketing is psychology. When you think about it, they're actually extremely sure. connected, interconnected. And, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, they do it. I think even to an extent, a band can do it. I think if they, if a, if a, if an app can do it, a band can do it. Cause yeah, yeah. you <laughs> have to, you have to realize though, like with everything, it's like, okay, I am talking to another human being, so I can't just look at it and completely manipulate you into, you know, just liking me. But yeah, but the, yeah. And, 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 and bands don't have that kind of psychology degree or psychology yeah. Uh, yeah. like the, like the people who you know get you to come back to the casino do and, yeah. and plus not to mention the money behind it yeah um so i know you I, I hear your original point of like bands need to get off their ass and go to the mall and promote i've always said that and yeah. i've i've been called the hardest working guy in music by several people and i know other musicians who have been called that too um so there's i don't think there's necessarily a shortage of working hard but i think that there's definitely a community and um education around working smart yeah that exactly. we're definitely missing and, and i kind of want this podcast and i know there's other podcasts that yeah. have built communities like that where it's like here's how you can be a diy diy artist and make it work keep these things in mind yeah implement this way um, even, you know, making videos on your iPhone for free so that you can spend that $1,500 on marketing. Like exactly. we originally were talking yeah. about, Yeah, those things go a long way, but they can only go so far. And that this app that your friend is inventing mm -hmm. sound off, it's called sound off. Yeah. Can only go so far it can. if, if you don't get all 7 billion people in the world mm -hmm. downloading it, like Instagram and Facebook have this and, is and TikTok. One thing I always keep in mind too, when it comes to stuff like this, because at the end of the day, how much am I going to promote it to? Because at the end of the day, where am I, where am I going to put my, my energy? Because mm -hmm. as much as I, I like my, what my friend is doing and I think it's a great app and all that, my, my interest has to be on like my own career, my own music, you know? And so you're it, saying like, how much am I going to dump my music into this app as opposed to the apps where everybody is right now? TikTok, exactly. Instagram. Exactly. There's enough that you can do to still be on the app and support it and be a part of it. You know, there's things that you can do, but it doesn't need to become your entire don't I guess, I guess what I'm saying is don't put all your eggs in one basket and also remember that uh, like again it and it, it, it like I keep I always remember this is just to kind of like well I have to f I have to remember like what is in my best interest too. And that's something, unfortunately, one thing about me that I, I I can be a bit of a people pleaser to the point that I will put my own well being you know aside mm -hmm. for somebody else, and it really upset me or something. And I'll completely put everything that I feel aside for somebody else. But it's that also of like okay, I need to remember my own interests as well and that isn't even a selfish thing is to remember that like hey 
I want to be a musician, so yeah, I need yeah. to focus on being a musician. I need to focus on putting out good music that people want to hear and then going and as far as my promoting, my promoting can work in multiple different ways, right? So far, like my... And, my and it goes back to kind of growing that following at an arm's... at, at a distance. Yeah, like, at a distance, you yeah. Know, because... Having yeah. a balance. Yeah, you 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 said it best that like it's not a selfish thing, mm -hmm. but sometimes, oftentimes, I'm finding more and more as I grow up, the more selfish that I make my goals and my hours, mm -hmm. the more I'm actually giving to the people who want me to give what they want me to give. Exactly. So your fans want you to put out music and mm -hmm. give them music and bring them a live show yeah, and give it your all. And by the only way you're going to be able to accomplish that is to be really selfish with your time mm -hmm. and be really selfish with all these things that are going to be in the grind video game that and you have to manage exactly. to make work, um, to, to make your fans happy. And prioritize. A prioritizing is extremely important because mm -hmm. if I like, here's a great example. Working this happens smart. so much to, especially bands who are who tour every day, who are who are playing constant um, shows. Mm -hmm. Is they let's say I played a show, and then I went out with my band, my friends, whatever that night, and we stayed up out all night doing the craziest stuff and yeah. then the next show i'm i can't i barely have a voice anymore yeah you know? not to mention like you didn't add everyone from the email list the, yeah you didn't do that <laughs> there's in, that uh there's that meme of um what you think it looks like backstage and there's like girls and partying and exactly drinking, what it actually looks like backstage and yeah. everyone's on their phone yeah, yeah the the, the um, after sh the after show party, uh, the after party no longer exists in our world. It's, it's yeah. actually kind of just like a, you got to get to work and prioritize. And I think, I think there needs to be a downtime. I think there has to be a balance of, I think everything just needs to be balanced. I think there's a balance between how much I give to another person, mm -hmm. like, like personally, how much I give to myself personally, how much I give to my art and then how much I give to the fans, it all comes down to a perfect, you know, finding a perfect balance. And um, if you don't have that balance or if like, like give you an example, you can't. Um, OK, that's actually a great example. You, if you add too much eggs to cookies, they're going to come out weird. If you add too much yeah. flour to something, if you add too much baking soda to something, it's going to come out soup. It's going to not come out the way you wanted it to. It might still come out a cookie, but it's not going to be a good cookie. Yeah, that's so, a fair analogy. Like if yeah. you're if you're adding too much promotion, yeah, then you're just going to seem like the guy who's promoting so much, exactly. but you only came out with one song the whole year. Yeah, <laughs> and then you didn't put out another song. Okay, well, great. I I love that song. When are you going to release something else? You know? The difficult part is it's always changing. And yeah, it is. It like is. You might put out an album that year and think, "What are you talking about? I put out twelve songs this year, like yeah. I did." And uh, but really only everyone really only paid attention to to the first two and then they were like i have other things to do or mm -hmm. uh, because of the way that psychology is changing yeah. right um i think that's why for me i'm not going to put out a full length until i start seeing a demand for a full length that's smart when people are telling me like maybe not even on a daily basis let's say like once a week hey you get in a comment section hey when are you going to put a, a, a record when are you know or whatever like when you start getting that that's when I'll put out a full length or say if I'm on a label um, and the label wants me to put out a record because they're seeing from my numbers or from my from my yeah, whatever, yeah. you know, and this this is within the perfect world of the label has my interest in mind, not, you know, not yeah. like uh, like how some labels can Not be. to mention they're going to pay for it. Hey, exactly. If you're going to pay me to make an album, I'll do it right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you're going to pay, hey, if you're going to give me 20000 to go make a record, then I will go make a record. Yeah. I do not mind doing that. I, well, that's another reason yeah. why it's, it's easier said than done, yeah. especially than it used to be because, yeah, labels used to be like, here's a hundred grand, go make oh, yeah. a record. And so 
so bands were like, that's my job now. Yep. No questions asked. Yep. Whereas nowadays, like, you know, we have these side jobs. Do you, where do you work during the day? Do you have a side so job? So right now I'm currently out of work and I'm spending a lot of my time doing music and then just applying for jobs in the morning or going to interviews or whatever. But, um, I, what were you doing before COVID? I was working retail at Spencer's. Oh, so, right. Yeah, yeah. You just said that. Yeah. So there you go. Where like, you know, you had this job that consumed a lot of hours mm -hmm. because you're paying for, uh, what's okay. your producer's name again? Uh, Freddie. Freddie. Yeah. To make your stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and edit your videos. So... Uh, it, it's a lot harder to go to the mall now and promote yeah. when you're working this job and you have all these things to balance and you have to make TikTok videos. And so it's, uh, it's a really tough, ba it's really tough to find that balance. Mm -hmm. And, but that's, you know, that's part of what I want to implement in the video game is like, and that's another thing where it's like, it's, it's hard to do for ourselves. It's hard to consider ourselves myself Inc. Yeah. And, and, and manage all those things like a business. Right. Whereas when it's something like a video game, yeah. it's like, Oh, I have to take care of my character's health. I have to do this yeah. because it's part of the game. Yeah. So when we were on tour main sale, uh, that's how the game kind of came up is okay. we were like, man, all this shitty stuff happens, man, there's so much work that needs to be done in such yeah. a short amount of time. We have to do this. We have to do that. Yeah. It's overwhelming, but just imagine like it was a cool video game and then this yeah. happened and then the tire popped, like that would be so oh, cool yeah. in a video game. So then anything that seemed overwhelming or too, like too much work, um, or if like we got in a little tiff about something, we'd just be like, Hey man, this is part of the video game. Like it, it's you just funny that get you over actually <laughs> want to call it a, a, like do a video game about it. Cause literally for years, it's been called the game, you know? Right. And yeah. it literally, it is a game. My life, uh, even life is any, a game. Any in piece general. of entrepreneurship is yeah, oh, yeah. kind of like it, uh, taught to be looked at as a game. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of how it naturally came up. And you know, I've got no intentions of, uh, allegating my time to game development by any means, but yeah. it's, it's funny to joke about just to get through the hours of the day that you don't want to do like filing your taxes. That's part of the video game. That's like, part of it. Hey, your yeah. character does not want to go to the, go to jail. File those taxes. Yeah. File the taxes. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, let's think about another, a, a good one because this will, I, I really think it's funny. Um, you know, because like, uh, one way that we can all manage our days, I think most people do this, is we do it day by day. You know, we manage like, yeah. okay, within this day, I'm going to get this done. Within this day, I'm going to get this done. Yeah, and, prioritize. And, yeah, you prioritize. But then a lot of, for a lot of us, we'll do our check marks and then we'll be like, I still have like two or three things left. All right, I'm going to do them tomorrow. And um, and so we roll it over in tomorrow and sometimes that's fine. You know, that it, it's your life. It's, it's whatever you feel like, but sometimes that can also be harmful for you because it's like, now I'm procrastinating because what turned into, I, I just put one thing for tomorrow turned into two things on the next day and the next day. And or the next writing day. that song became so important to my character at that time mm -hmm. that I ended up taking up the whole day doing that. And I pushed taxes to the next day, exactly. which I couldn't do because I had that dentist appointment and this and this and that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like sometimes the priorities kind of um, stack up and and become more favorable than others. So yeah. that is also why artists especially are the kings and queens of procrastination, right? Yeah. So, well, yeah. we're, we're like well over an hour here and yeah. it's been really fun talking to you. It's I appreciate some... you coming up, man. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for wanting me to come on. This Thanks was for definitely being on. a great time. Where can people find your music right now? Yeah, um, Spotify, iTunes, um, all the you know normal places that you can that you listen to music. Ten or uh, not. <laughs> Tinder. 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 Yes. Hey, right. I used to promote on Tinder I, I, and it worked. I, I, when I'm I changed sure my would. preferences to male and female. Ah, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. I'm trying to remember what is it. It's not Tinder. Twitter. That's what I was trying to say. T or, uh, not Twitter. Oh, what is it? Title. Thank you. I was trying to. I was, I I've was never like, heard a title. There's a T in it. It's a. It's another like platform, you okay. know. But but any of the normal music places. No, don't. I'm not on Tinder. You can't find my music on Tinder. <laughs> but um, I uh yeah. So any of the normal places. And I have a new single coming out um next week, uh the 23rd of April. Oh so. yeah. What's that? Do you, do you have yes. you released the title of that song? Yes, it's called One Eye Open. Um, and it will be up very very shortly. 23rd of April. You said 23rd of April. 
Yeah. Sweet. So be on the lookout for that, everyone. Yeah. I also got you this vocal spray, courtesy oh, of Vocalese. Thank you so yeah. much. I actually was going to bring you a CD. Oh. Uh, I will, if you can give me your address later, I will ship it to you. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, of I appreciate that. I mean, I, I, nowadays I don't even have a CD player in my van, but um, mm-hmm. I'll uh, I'll I'll save it in my in my All collection right. of CDs, and cool. I'll definitely be sharing some of your music and the new song on, you. on the on the playlist. Thank you so much for having me on today. Yeah, dude. Thanks, Alex. Sidewalks right. end. We yep. really did it. Thank you for coming up, man. Thanks, appreciate guys. It. All right. Episode 32, Alex Williams, Sidewalks End. Thank you so much, dude, for being on the podcast. That was really fun and interesting. A lot of cool analogies about cookies and pasta. And a lot of things I didn't know, like uh, emo TikTok. I'm going to have to check that out and figure out what all the hype is about and try and get some people to check out all of these great artists that I'm having on the podcast. Be sure to check out State of My Art playlist on Spotify and follow all of the great artists that I've had on the show here. And of course, I'll be including Alex's new song, One Eye Open, as well as some of his other stuff on the playlist so you can check his music out and find him easier than the algorithms might let you otherwise. And a big, delicious, warm, happy thank you to Vocal Ease for hooking Alex up with some throat spray. If you want to try your very own Vocal Ease, as well as their all natural products, visit this website beside my head, this reference link. I'll leave it in the description as well. It'll get you 15% off your entire order at Vocal Ease. So yeah, pick this stuff up. It's magical. I promise you will be very glad you did. Thank you again to Alex of Sidewalks N for being on the podcast. And thank you for checking out this episode of State of My Art Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like, follow, subscribe if you really like it. Click the notify bell so that you can find out about more episodes like this one and more great artists like Alex of Sidewalks N. Thank you guys again. I'll see you next week for another episode of State of My Art Podcast.